You are the connecting dot uh, in the designing part, the engineering part, and the business side of it. Because ultimate aim is to get business out of the product that you, you that you are creating. Absolutely, market will the reality will tell you whether what have you thought of actually works or not. Somebody right. could a bunch of people sit in a room and design saying, "Hey, we think this will work." You put it out into the market, and then customers react in ways that you didn't expect. So, then a great example, right? You must have seen little pop up. Try to book an Ola ride, which says your driver is currently dropping someone else, and then will come to you. You never got. A cab that was currently dropping someone else. You would always think, who says why is it required and so on and so forth. How much money can we make from this, or how much money can we save from this? Hi Ganesh, I'm calling from the Ola's head office. So he said, yes. Tell me what feedback you have. So he says, can you please turn it off? I'll probably share some slides later, and you can you can figure out how to sure. fit them in, right? So this is what you see, right? All born in the same year. Obviously, they live in a different city, married, have children, are all wealthy, like traveling and so on, right? But you probably wouldn't sell the same thing to Mukesh Ambani and Johnny Deaver if you wanted to make a product or a service or something like that. They are very different people. They have very different needs. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ed Talk, a podcast where we discuss everything that educates you. And uh, in this third episode, we got an opportunity to discuss. With someone who dealt with what goes on behind the applications, such as Uber, Swiggy, Zomato, it has become you know part of our daily routine. But we have never thought what makes a driver to cancel our rides. Uh, why are they protesting a lot of times against a lot of things that happens uh, around them? So we got an opportunity to discuss it, uh, discuss all of this with uh, Mr. Arun Srilalan Nair. Uh, he has been into product management uh, from an application side for more than a decade. He's also a visiting professor in the top tier universities such as IIMs and uh, also the Masters Union. And uh, we have discussed about a lot of things like, uh, you know, you might wonder, was the metro meant for rich or poor? If you want to know questions to such kind of answers, make sure that you check out the podcast and like and subscribe and click on that red button i'll see you in the podcast thank you hi arun how are you hi sagar good afternoon i i'm great i hope you're well as well and hi to all the viewers hey thank you very much arun and thank you very much for joining us for the session it's a pleasure and uh, we have, we have done so many things to schedule this meeting uh, a lot of things happen in between but uh, happy to have you finally so uh, to uh, set things in context arun if you can help us understand about you better so that we can start the conversation from somewhere sure sure let's start with career because that's probably what people typically mean when they say start with you but i in the last year or so i've realized that there are a lot more roles beyond career as well. So a quick background about my, myself. My name is Arun. I am a product management leader. I've worked with product management companies building mobile apps and websites for a really long time. I've worked with Microsoft, Ola, uh, McKinsey as a product management consultant, UiPath, which is a robotics process automation solutions company. And Bajaj Finserve Group, where I was leading product management for their healthcare tech-focused app, as well as their super app, which brings in all of the BFSI offerings together into one single uh, portal. Currently, I lead product management for a small deep tech AI ML company in the intelligent document understanding space, right? So that's a very quick brief or timeline of my career. Yes, over to you. Okay, great. Uh, um, product management, we all are hearing it left, right, and center, especially when it comes to, you know, what's the highest paying uh, uh, profession these days. It's sure. uh, in some top three rankings, uh, data scientist, data analyst, and, and product management. What is product management? I mean, uh, how does this work? Is it about designing the application or uh, getting into nitty gritties of it? You know? Sure, sure. And Great question. Uh, I think every product management manager in any company should ask themselves at some point of time, hey, what value am I bringing here? What am I doing really? Right. And trust me, other functions like an engineering team, a design team, an HR team, or a finance team, or an operations team will 
eventually have a hard conversation with the product manager and ask, hey, what exactly do you do here? Why are you even needed, right? So it's important <laughs> that as product managers, we have the confidence in our own ability and the value we bring to the table and the role, right? Yeah. So what do product managers do? In a single line or in a nutshell, they are there to do whatever it takes to deliver value to the customer, right? Now let's unpack that a bit because it's just too, too abstract, yeah, yeah. right? So traditionally product management, and, and I'm talking about software, right? The product management is applicable in things like manufacturing and other in uh, capital the physical products. and machine. Yes. However, that the the frameworks and some of the processes that you would use there would be would be significantly different from what you would do in software. Though the, the basic principles would still apply, right? So now let's stick to stick to software product management, by which I mean product managers for mobile apps and websites, right? So in these tech companies, product management as a discipline has traditionally been shown as a Venn diagram at the intersection of three circles, which are UX, tech, and business. These are three separate verticals in themselves in any company. So you have a design team, which is the UI UX team. You have a business or sales team that is focused on selling products, driving better revenue numbers, driving user acquisition and customer growth and so on and so forth. And you have a technology deliverable team, which is an engineering team, a lot of engineers who write the code for the apps and the uh, websites and so on and so forth. The product manager intersects all these three and they have to have not just a surface level understanding, they have to have a fairly deep understanding of all three. And they need to know how one impacts the other, right? So that's a little level of detail. Let, let me give you a very small example of a feature that from my previous experience, right? So in one of the companies, we were trying to build a marketplace for two different types of users. One would be a provider and one would be a customer. Uh, it's, it's similar to Amazon or Ola or Uber and so on, where you have customers like us who want to avail of a product or a service and you have service providers who provide the service right so in my past experience there was a marketplace company like this the design team for example just came up with a proposal where they said hey we want to show whether the provider the seller of the service is online or not by using a small green dot whenever next to the name whenever they're online which is very similar to what you would see in google chat or <clears throat> several other websites, right? Right. So the design team just thinks, hey, this is enough to, to show whether things are online or not. And they, without the product manager in place, they would just throw it over the wall to engineering and say, hey, can you build this, right? Okay. The sales team would, uh, would have probably given the requirement initially and said that, hey, customers want to know if this service provider is online and hence, can you design something like this? And hence the designer has come up with that green dot. Now, the product manager here is there to unpack things a bit and say, hey, what is the, the customers might ask for something. So let's look at the business part first. The customers might say they want something, but is this really good for the business? Does the seller always want to advertise that they are online? Do they want to go anonymous sometimes or whatever? Do we have a risk that somebody keeps pestering them, right? So those are right. business acquisition and so on metrics, right? Let's assume that the design part is fine, which is that a green dot is the best way to represent whether someone is online. So no need for any inputs there. But the delivery part, which is the technology part, is where the product manager would say, hey, just putting a green dot doesn't tell me the entire story. What if the user has closed their browser or their app three seconds ago? Do you still want to show them as green? What if they closed it and come came back within the next five seconds, right? Do you want to show that they went off and then they came on? What if they have the browser tab open for the last 10 minutes, but they are looking at something else? Do you still want to consider them online, right? There are all of these users, use cases, which maybe the design team and the sales team have never thought about. The tech team will blindly try to implement whatever the design team told them to. And then when the user actually hits all of these edge cases, the, the tech team will say, hey, you never asked me to do any of this. So sorry, I, I can't help you there. It's just going to go nowhere. Right. So the product manager in this example sits at the intersection of business UX or design and technology and tries to get everything aligned so that the feature is successful. It finally does what was intended, what it was intended to do. Right? Okay. Okay. So makes sense. Makes sense. 
सो दिस इज वेन समन इज अ प्रोडक्ट मैनेजर इन हाउस लाइक यू आर लेट्स से यू सेड यू आर यू आर इन ओला so when ola wants a product so they will how, how does the flow works will they tell you this is what i need and then you plan you know this this might work and then you said with the team how does the flow uh, work right right now great question and the textbook definition could be that the product manager should discover requirements of the product and what would work and what not in the market by themselves however it depends on the size and maturity of the organization right so very large organizations the size of microsoft and google and so on will have so many hundreds of teams that a product manager won't cannot do everything by talking to the customer to understand the requirements then go through design and then be able to work with the tech team and so on they'll own a smaller piece and they might receive requirements from say a sales team or a marketing team and so on and so forth right so for them they are an internal customer who's whose requirements they are working with right in smaller companies often product managers are either hired or a sharp business person or a business analyst by the way is a great role which can easily transition to a product manager a manager role <clears throat> they transition and because it's a small team they are able to cover the entire pipeline from requirements discovery and definition right through delivery through making it success in further iteration right everything may be owned by one person right okay so does that ask the question yeah yeah it 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 kind of does so uh, in a big organization you said that the requirements come to you and then you work on it in a small organization which is like a startup you kind of do a lot of brainstorming and what can be done how can we make it better and then you discuss it amongst the team and then you know you work on it and you are as you said that you are the connecting dot uh, in the designing part the engineering part and the business side of it because ultimate aim is to get business out of the product that you, you that you are creating absolutely and just to just a point there it's not so the brainstorming will bring some thoughts some ideas which can go in first but then market will the reality will tell you whether what have you thought of actually works or not so i right. could go through several uh, examples of where somebody could a bunch of people sit in a room and design saying hey we think this will work you put it out into the market and then customers react in ways that you didn't expect so then you need to go let's, back to the board and say let's have hey, some example okay, of happening? this absolutely great example right now all of you must have seen this little pop up that comes when you try to book an ola ride which says your driver is currently dropping someone else and then will come to you right right so i was part of the team that built that feature i was the product manager <clears throat> for that feature when it was developed this was around 2016 2017 which means that prior to that you never got a cab that was currently dropping someone else you would always if you made an ola cab booking request you would always get an empty cab right right now we when i say we i mean myself as the product manager i had a design i had an engineering lead working along with me so a few people we would and probably a sales team who says why is it required and so on and so forth how much money can we make from this or how much money can we save from this and so on they would all sit together in a room and ideate and brainstorm hey how could we solve this problem right and you come out with the first attempt at the problem one of the principles and we'll go into this in some more detail is what is called phased rollout so i started launching this in a very very small scale with just majestic bus station which is a large bus station in bangalore okay and phoenix market city mall which is again a large mall near whitefield in bangalore right so i i developed this feature along with my teammates and said hey let's just launch it only in these two locations and let's not worry about it anymore right then we found as we scaled up further and further through the rest of bangalore through other cities like bangalore and mumbai and chennai and uh, and on the other metros and so on you find unexpected problems i remember this anecdote with a driver i remember his name his name is ganesh right in mumbai so i had called up this gentleman because i had the tracking systems to know yes this driver has done several rides where he has currently dropped one customer and then picked up another customer nearby he's done three or four of them that morning right so i call up this gentleman and say uh, hi ganesh i am calling from the ola's head office uh, 
I see that you have done four rides this morning and how do you like the experience, right? So he said, uh, that's pretty good. I dropped off one person in IIT Bombay and I got my next pickup also within IIT Bombay. So my understanding was, you know, so things look like they're fine. It's working fine. And I asked him, are you happy with it? So he said, uh, sir, are you the, the manager or are you the boss for this feature? So he said, yes, tell me what feedback do you have? So he says, can you please turn it off? <laughs> Why? He says, it's super irritating. From from the morning, I it just keeps assigning these rides back to back. I don't have time to take a toilet break or take a tea break or uh, even, or have breakfast or whatever, or even refuel my car. Because there are just rides that keep coming back to back and say, how, after you're done with oh. one, just go to the next one. After you're done with the second, go to the third, right? So you can't so, switch off. These these guys switch uh, off. That I'm, I don't want to drive right now, but they just sure. can't because the drives are coming. They couldn't say it. I, I had not thought of that. When I say I, as in we sitting in the room. Yeah, the team. Thought, yeah, yeah. The big deal. You know, just let's, uh, uh, let's allow uh, the system to just book rides back to back. What was the big deal, right? I, we didn't realize that it could become so bad. And it was hurting the customer experience because the cab driver, now when they need to refuel their cab, they need to ask the customer, hey, can I stop at a petrol pump, right? And the customer yeah. asks, why do you need to do this when I'm sitting? Why don't you do this in your free time, right? And the cabbie really can't explain that, boss, I don't get any free time. It just is, the system is just giving me rights back to back, right? Why I brought this up is that when I started out at small scale with just the Phoenix Mall and the Majestic bus station in Bangalore, this was not a big problem because people will come to the bus station and go away somewhere else. They are unlike to go to the mall. I mean, not all of them will go to the mall. They'll go somewhere else where this problem will not occur. It occurred only at scale, right? right. So the, the point I'm trying to illustrate is you can sit in a room and design whatever you like. The market will eventually tell you whether it's working and whether they like it, whether they want to use it the way it is or not. Don't... Right. Now... As, as a product manager or as a UX researcher, a usability researcher, which is part of the role of product manager, don't accept the solution that the customer tells you. So in this case, the driver, who is my customer in the sense, was telling me, can you please turn it off? Of course, I don't want to turn it off. Right? I, I want to make it successful. So then we went back and brainstormed and said, hey, you know, there are these problems. Should we give them a button to say, I am done for now. Please, I want to go offline after this. Then let them take a break, go have tea or take a nap or do whatever. And then come back and say, now I'm ready to take my next ride, right? So you make these feature enhancements and improve the feature based on the feedback, but don't ask or don't accept the solution that the customer is going to say, you know, why don't you do this? No, I'll figure right. out what I need to do, but give me the feedback of what is the problem that you're facing. So right. yes, this is an example of... Uh, Great uh, example. Great. I, I guess we all have seen, I, I myself have been in all uh <laughs> with the Ola, what happened? Ola auto or Ola cab. I don't remember if it was an auto or a cab. But what happened is I was sitting there and he said, like, can I uh, refuel uh, my thing? And I said, yeah, okay, take it, do it. Uh, right. it. It just goes always here. You know, you, you should have done it uh, when you were Earlier, free. Right. But now I get to know that they didn't have the time. But now I guess it's it's just that when they're driving... They get a request whether they want to accept it or don't accept it. Is is it that Th those way? are those are different business models? Again, uh, things the the operational teams which work with the with the drivers and I'm sticking to the case of Ola. Uh, Uber is similar but has some other differences. Okay. They keep tweaking the 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 methods to make it a accept model. That means the the user the driver has to accept your request versus a reject model, saying that if you don't reject it, it'll it will be given to you. Right. 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 So though uh, I, the teams keep tweaking that to understand uh, by city by city or even regions within a city, they could have the uh, amount of control, even time of the day. Probably in the morning, they say, hey, I don't want to allow any rejection. So just accept it. Right. Whereas later in the day, when, when there is not a peak hour rush, you can say, hey, okay, if you, if you want to reject it, there's always someone else who will accept it. So we'll allow you to reject a request if you like. So right. there are those dynamics that come into play. Great, great. Very relatable example. I guess now we, our viewers will also understand why a lot of drivers took you guys to the fuel stations. <laughs> or, or maybe maybe for, for, for their loo, they kind of ask you to wait for five minutes. All right, great. Uh, Arun, uh, this is one very relatable example of what we know. Uh, we don't know what happens in Google, Microsoft. 
right right uh, very big things uh, we have google sheets we have uh, microsoft excel and then gmail and they they have ample amount of products drive and right. so on and so forth um how does brainstorming work there uh, i assume the team would be bigger the aim would be bigger and you said that you release things in phases so before we uh, we, we get to this that question how do you decide the phases ki i want to do it in this country i mean sorry this city this place uh what are the parameters for you just right. for a you know basic understanding great question how do you decide the phases right now um okay so when you develop a feature it is for a certain target market right now let me give you an example of how you would define the target there is this concept called jobs to be done by professor Chris, uh, clayton christensen he wrote a book called jobs to be done uh, in fact uh, remind me about this after the next story sure. right I'll, i'll tell you about jobs to be done right so the idea is try not to define your target market by demographics which is don't say my typical user or my ideal user is a 25 to 40 year old and this is this is what i see uh, a lot uh, uh, 25 to 45 40 year old urban working professional uh, probably in a tech job um, in bangalore or mumbai or hyderabad or delhi or something like that uh, unfortunately a lot of product managers are mbas and mbas come from school from these uh, b schools and what not and they get they they think the world is this little bubble of people who look like them right and i say look like them as in the, these kind of demographics of uh, age and you know uh, english savvy tech savvy uh, probably working in a tech field and so on that's less than 2% of the not even 2% right. of the of india's population you are essentially ignoring 98% of the population the other thing is don't define by demographics so uh, l- let me let me give you an illustrative example and uh, sagar i don't know i'll probably share some slides later and you can you can figure out how to sure. fit them in right who is this person yeah got it uh the richest man of india maybe <laughs> uh, apparently apparently there's a jostle between him and the second richest and they keep switching places every now and then which happened last week right so yeah, this is it's uh, mukesh ambani mr mukesh ambani mr mukesh and this is Mr. Johnny Lever, yeah. Johnny Lever, and this is Nitin Gadkari. This is Nitin Gadkari, right? Now, if you go by demographics, which is what I said, age, gender, lives somewhere, whatever. Mukesh Ambani and Johnny Lever. if you want to make a product or a service or something like that they are very different people they have very different needs oh this right? is interesting this is interesting yeah yeah, yeah. right in fact let me sh- uh, this probably will be more relatable to the indian audience that's why i brought this slide up but uh, the w- so everyone probably knows this gentleman yep prince charles uh, no longer prince king charles yes king so charles a- i'm sorry king yeah, charles he's sir. the king now <laughs> right uh so uh, everyone would know this gentleman but not sure whether everyone would know this this is uh, mr ozzy osborne who is one of the ozzy rock osborne. stars uh, right. the front man of of uh, uh black sabbath and you know a, a great musician in in his own right and so on so similar things right? and here it's a little more in your face because both of them live in a castle uh both of them are married twice and so on and so forth right and both of them live in the same city of course uh probably mukesh ambani and johnny lever might live in in mumbai but uh, nitin gadkari travels all of them travel a lot that's okay right so this, yeah. this is just to illustrate that now here there is a king and there is a rock star right this person the king is very sober and is a public figure and uh, you know very uh, formal whereas ozzy osbourne is known to be super flamboyant and super avant garde and not uh, not respect any 
any expectations and so on he just makes his own way he's he's very flamboyant uh, on stage in interviews and so on and so forth right so what are the product or service that you would want to make you wouldn't de- if you if you define your target segment as male born in 1940 or wh- whatever born in some year lives in a in a metro city has children whatever whatever then both these people will come into your filter but you can't sell right. the same thing to both of them right so this is where you come to the jobs to be done framework which is define your target segment by what you're trying to solve for them so if you're saying anyone who so if if for example i am the product manager at zomato or swiggy my target segment is anyone who is in a situation where they don't have time to cook or they are unable to cook for whatever reason but they need tasty and healthy food fairly quickly right right it could be prince king charles it could be a student sitting in a hostel right but when they are in that situation that is the job that they need done that is the problem that they are having right it doesn't matter their age group doesn't matter whether they are married which city they live in and so on doesn't matter right right so that's what i mean by how do you decide when you go f- i'm trying to answer the question how did you decide phase roll out define your target segment don't define by demographics right the definition should be on based on what is the problem that you're trying to solve for them which could be along a few axes one of them could be demographic so you can say you know if you are for example if you are making something to do with uh, i don't know jay z right you want to make some video or some podcast with him or whatever very likely your demographic is going to be the 25 to 40 year olds the 70 right. year old is unlikely to listen to jay z right so you can define by demographic again it's not only it it the, so that will be uh age probably not gender both genders do listen to jc and uh you will have something like uh say does listen to western music and is interested in rap and hip hop and so on and so forth right probably someone who's very much into classical music or uh, or uh, only bollywood music may not relate to jc uh, so right. much right so figure out the jobs we done along either demographics or location so in the case of ola it was location when i had to start out with the with the phase roll out it was just that i'm going to take a small location or two small locations in this case majestic bus station and the, and a mall uh, or it could be financial right it could be an access that says hey i'm making a wealth management product i'm going to start with people whose net worth is 10 crores and more or even 100 mm. crores and more i want to start mm. with them and then you know we'll gradually grow expand the pie and so on and so forth it could be uh, so it could be interests it could it could be several several different axes right so now figure out what axis does the product that you are trying to build lie on take a mm-hmm. small sample of that and that's how you do the phase roll out okay so what i mean um, for for my super understanding uh, what 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 you're trying to uh, say here is demographics and all these are part of the common things that you're looking at you know but uh, the majority should be what problem are you solving i mean as right. you said the demography right. is it can be one thing and you know uh location the financial aspect the location could be one the finance could be one you know uh, you there could be others those, right yeah there could be there could be n number of things but right. the uh, but the problem that you are so- solving should be the center of it absolutely absolutely and okay. ensure that you don't default to demographics if if you are making as i said for in the example of ola it's a pick up and drop service right the demographics right. don't matter every one from a school student to an 80 year old might need to pick up and drop drop stuff right right so don't right. say my target segment is this to this first right right second advice or tip to probably young viewers who might be watching this as i said mba uh, students and so on and so forth uh, remember that this like yourself definition which is a young working professional techy tech savvy that is you know has a smartphone has a laptop is english educated has a fairly large income and has some disposable income and so on and so forth this is a very very minuscule portion of the population most of india and in fact most of the rest of the world doesn't uh, identify with this so if you are right. trying to make say an agri tech product is no good making it in english a farmer in telangana is not going to understand your english app 
right so put right, yourself right. in the mind or in the shoes of that target customer and solve for them right right that makes sense so a lot of thought process i imagine would go in creating a product for a product manager it, it's uh, it's very hard as in uh, it's very hard to relate to who the actual customer is because we can right. only relate to ourselves it right, takes a lot of right. effort to go spend time with them immerse them yourself in their surroundings and review all your assumptions the agritech ex example is great now most mobile phone apps are typically in english because uh, i mean that's what the ecosystem is about it's it's largely english but right. a large part of india doesn't understand english you need to have content in those local languages regional languages you right. your it's not just content as in help content or stuff the entire app has to be in in every button every text everything has to be in that language right so so figure it out right right it, to make sense make sense right Makes it sense. might it might you might not even have great internet connectivity sitting in metro cities you might say hey i have great internet connectivity go 200 kilometers outside of metro city then internet connectivity just drops from your right. phone right. will your phone work or will your app or solution work even if there is flaky internet connectivity think about it lot of checkpoints i mean i guess i don't have a proper question to ask but i can imagine there are a lot of checkpoints that goes behind creating a product that we just say ki yaar this is just not working it's not that good you know uh but yeah i guess we should start respecting product managers it's a very difficult task you know i've never imagined my one of my flatmates actually is a product manager we always used to tease him uh, he works in a renowned uh, logistics company but now i think he has a very difficult job so i'll i'll stop it for today and i'm going to go and thank him for the effort that he's trying to do giving back, this is for me giving back to the society through tech uh okay so this is this is a lot about product management let's let's come down to small uh, you know let's let's move on to the technology now uh arun you are visiting iim uh you have been you are alumni of uh, iim uh, calcutta yes. and now you are now you are a visiting professor as well uh by the way for viewers uh, masters union masters union we all have heard of it uh, arun is also a visiting professor there he's coming this month itself we, while we are recording Next this podcast week, this is, yes yeah so this is january uh, almost second week so maybe he's coming in like third week uh, so um, what what i understand is uh, learning something is is difficult it's it's difficult implementing it is more difficult and delivering the same kind of information and making sure that other people learn from your experience is way difficult you see so i have immense respect for teachers and professors and you know that's why we started this podcast to discuss all of this so first of all thank you very much for your service in that sense and tell me what are the gaps that you see you have you have qualified for i am uh, are there how is the education industry doing now uh, why there was a need of masters union to come into the play were we not going great with iits and iims and isbs of the world uh let let me not speak particularly about uh, masters union or any yeah other, i mean companies uh, like that you were right. disrupt, disrupt through their different actions sure sure their different models right now education as we know it for anyone less than say 50 years old or even 70 80 years old uh, the system in india was actually the system worldwide is designed and it does exactly what it's designed to do and it does it very well right it's designed to produce employees who will take orders and it does that very well right but that is probably not what the world needs today that's definitely not what youth want to to, to do to do today they don't want to be order takers who blindly follow something that that a boss or or some uh, organization right. asked them to do right so it's uh, prior to this and when i say prior to this i'm not talking about a thousand years ago or so on uh, even until very recently and even today in certain professions you have what is called an apprenticeship model and that is in fact coming into tech and some other uh, ways as well for example if someone is a uh is a carpenter right or someone say hair stylist hair dresser right they typically they they may or may not take some course or some training or whatever 
but they will work along even 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 in uh, uh, professions like being uh, like medicine which is either being a nurse or a doctor or so on and so forth they start out as an assistant right to a very experienced person who gives them apprenticeship saying that hey start out with some of the easier tasks or start out with some of the tasks that you need to do super well but it's not it's not costly to the patient or to the customer in, in some sense if you don't do it great if you even if you don't do a okay job it's not too bad right so something like suturing or right. uh, delivering injections in the case of uh, of uh, medicine okay it might hurt but it's not going to kill the guy if you don't uh, in uh, you, you don't uh, yeah you don't inject the inject injection very well right so start with that and then you slowly get, go on uh, gain experience and become better right so a lot of the institutions today are actually moving to that and that is in fact the role of what i i'm coming from the view of product management it's it's true in in, in other disciplines as well of an associate product manager saying that hey you come in first understand that you don't understand this field at all right admit hmm. to yourself that hey i am a novice i don't get anything let me work with someone who's more experienced follow them shadow them take parts of their job and try to do it myself get better at it and then hence take larger and larger parts till you become right. great at it yourself right um, so th- i think that is the philosophy with which many of the organizations many of the institutions today are coming up saying okay it has to be experiential learning don't sit in the classroom learn and say now i'm an expert and i can be great at whatever i do th- as soon as i step out of that room right 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 yes. okay Okay. So this was uh, actually, in a sense, the Gurukul model. But people don't like it when you say the Gurukul model because it, it reminds them of probably Veda Vyasa sitting under a tree and their their uh, disciples with him and so on. It it's not that. It's essentially apprenticeship. Saying, "Hey, live along with that with that guru." In the sense that there is an experienced person, start doing jobs along with them, and slowly you will also grow to become an experienced person. That's about it. right it's it's that philosophy of practice makes a man perfect so you you practice it with the man who's almost right. perfect in what they do right great um you you are a core team lead of nascom so we all have heard of almost everyone has heard of nascom but i am sure that 90% of us don't know what nascom is actually i mean we may know the full form of it but to the core of it what is nascom responsible for why does it exist right so nascom started out oh, in the late 80s if i'm uh, not mistaken as a an industry body representing at that time software services companies now it's essentially all technology or all software companies in india right it's literally uh, national association of software services companies as the full form but it's no yeah, longer yeah. just services it's it's all software right so what does it do it's like say fiki for uh the, the uh, you know for uh, manufacturing or siam for, right. for automobile manufacturing so on it's an industry body that represents the interests of its members to the government or or so that is one and the other part is it provides a platform for people to interact with each other so let's take the example of say ontc which is the essentially e-commerce huge e-commerce right. platform right so all of the e-commerce players in india including global ones like amazon uh, and flipkart and so on and so forth would place their requests or their views to the gov- the government and the ministries via nascom right so nascom is the advisory okay. and the and the body that says hey here are the interests of the industry because the policy makers don't understand the industry and vice versa the right. uh, the right. uh, industry doesn't understand how regulation should be what is it affecting what's not affecting and so on so it is the platform for having a dialogue between all of these parties that's the one side the other side is that it uh, it allows people to network with each other so for example today everyone's worried about ai with generative ai coming in in place uh, especially with chat gpt and so on with open ai uh, every company is being asked to have an ai strategy and uh, they really don't know what to do about it right? right so they can come to the nascom events and forums 
and interact with each other as to say, hey, you know, this is what I think I'm uh, AI is going to do in edutech or AI is going to do in healthcare tech or insure tech or whatever, right? And meet another founder or another participant and, and ask them, hey, what are you doing with AI? Right. So these these are you know that you are not talking to a random person because that other person is also a member of NASCOM. Hence, right. they are in software. They are some amount of quality has been vetted already. So you can have a great discussion and network with them in these events. Okay. Okay. So it's an advisory to the government and a platform for all Networking. the techie, tech, technology guys out there. Right. Now, the advice okay. to the government is not one way. So it's uh, the government will also tell it, hey, since you are already in touch with so many tech companies, you are the industry body go do something in the industry. So this is where, for example, I am leading a charter where uh, the Prime Minister's Skill India Initiative has a lot of programs, right? And though many of those programs are in different kinds of skills and so on. But the Prime Minister's vision is that for the last 40 years, India has been a leader in software services. So you have services, yeah. Infosys, TCS, Wipro, Cognizant, all of these were massive software services companies. They are recognized the world over as software services leaders. However, we don't really have a great system to build software products of the kind of, say, Microsoft Excel or, uh, you know, Google Maps or things like that, which is software by itself, right? right? It's not services. Services is primarily manpower being used to, to deliver something, right? So how do you deliver software itself as a package? Uh, the ecosystem is, is not very mature there, right? Uh, and it comes down to education and skilling. Uh, not a lot of Indians understand what it takes to build software products. They are more likely to move to services, which is, a, as I said, it's, it's a function of the education system that we've had where you depend on a boss to tell you what to do and then you do it. So that, that's primarily what services does, right? The client, right. in this case, the boss says, hey, I want this, this, this done, go do it and we can do it. We are growing up the value chain, but st still not there yet in terms of software products. So his mandate to NASCOM was upskill 50,000 product managers in the next couple of years, in fact, by 2025, right? And again, there are several verticals under that, including building and delivering new content for aspiring product managers, partnering with both organizations and educational institutions to figure out programs where we could upskill uh, product managers as well right. as set up sm small network. No, I won't call it networking. It's actually called mentoring. Mentoring groups where three or four industry uh, professionals who are already in their career want to make a transition. So probably they might be in project management. They might be a developer. They might be uh, in HR or any, any function. And they say, hey, you know, I think I want to make a mid-career transition. I want to learn more about product management. Should I take a course? What do I do to to kind of move into this field, they can speak to an experienced product manager. We will, we will, uh, we will, we as in uh, uh, me and my team at NASCOM, we'll set up the right interactions between the aspirants and a mentor who's already an experienced product manager and try to pair them together for say three months or so and so that they can learn from each other, right? So there are several, okay. several programs like this, including several in deep, deep tech as in yeah, uh, that's another vertical and so on. So yes, okay. this, this is what I mean by uh, my role as a part of the core team at NASCOM. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so product managers out there can join NASCOM, the the product management initiative that you guys are into. Can they? Can any product manager join and you know be part of the network? Uh, let me flip it around. So. NASCOM's members are actually companies. They are okay. typically not okay. individuals, right? Okay. It's an industry body. So industry companies are members of NASCOM. Those member companies delegate their, their okay. employees saying, hey, okay. I'm sending five people and I want them to be trained as uh, product managers. Can you please help with that? Now, how do we get the product managers who will train them? That is typically from, uh, from the core team of a few people from our personal contacts and uh, others that we reach out to, right? So okay. uh, we we reach out to industry known, well, well known leaders or personal contacts that we know who are great product managers, senior leaders in, in certain, uh, com in their own uh, industries, in their own companies and say, and ask them, hey, will you be a mentor for a cohort of say three or four people who would like to learn from you? Right, right, right. Um, all right, great. I mean, I, I asked this for the product managers out there who's, who are listening to us. Um, 
I mean, you know how how they can become better in what they are doing, and if it's the other way around, I'm not sure what the solution. But yeah, um, okay. You you said uh, you know, in 1990s around, I guess when we uh kind of opened our gates as a country for uh, you know international business to come in, and then the services boomed, and services. I mean, the technology service sector boomed basically, and we became like the uh back office of the world. That's what India is also known for. uh what do you think it will take us to become the front office of the world i mean to genuinely create the products uh, right let's let's try to expand it better where are the gaps and from where should we start is it just the basic i mean is it just the university education and all of that is just or it starts from the the pre school or the you know the first and second standards and everywhere where where oh, is there, the there change? are a lot of gaps in a lot of places i think the government has taken a uh a stab a, a big step in the right direction with the new education policy obviously there are there is a balance right as in there is a give and take there could be some defects compared to the current one and some uh, better uh, resolution things i think they they are trying to do a good job and they try to balance it uh, of course we have to see it play out it's just me sitting here reading through the document and saying it looks good after 10 right. years we'll know whether it actually uh, worked as intended and, and so on now coming back to this question on how do we need to do this there are so india and thanks to our prime minister our, our uh, central government ministry and so on has started flexing its muscle and showing its presence in the global stage right so it is important that india feels confident that yes i can do what it takes i am not someone to be pitied Right? right i am as much a player in the global stage in in any aspect whether it is economics whether it is sports whether it is uh, technology uh, infrastructure whatever it is i am as much a global leader and a player as some of these you know usually the western countries are looked down looked upon as right. as these global leaders put yourself among them and, and that's that sense of confidence is you can see it being instilled in in youngsters today right now that uh, now let's come specifically to to education now education i think even beyond the new education policy and things like that there are certain fundamental life skills which are unfortunately missing and it i don't think it's it's only in india across the world very mm-hmm. important things are missing right uh, for example how to manage personal finance you would see right. a lot of people who are highly educated doctors lawyers whatever right and they don't know how to manage their personal finances they don't know how to make investments they maximum put stuff into an fd and say hey these are my investments for the next 10 years right it's not going to work understand what global economics is about understand how you need to save for an emergency how do you need to save for retirement how much do you spend how do you borrow wisely smartly all of these and there's, there's, there's a fair amount of knowledge when it comes to us it's not too hard about right. one month of training will will pretty much do it right but this is sorely missing the other thing and this is true in india as compared to the west the west has is better at it but it's still not as where it should be right? it's still it's like uh, we are at we are at 1 there at 3 you need to get to 10 right right uh, in just a scale Right, so right, right. which uh, this uh, what i'm referring to is not uh, the financial education what i'm about to say this the 1 3 and 10 is how do you work together with people the exam mode of education right which essentially says you are given a grade based on your output you learn something you practice something you produce a project you produce a report you produce a thesis you write an exam whatever you output something even if the rest of the class weren't there was there doesn't matter uh you are graded based on based on your output right so we except for team sports and team sports are not really considered academic right right except for team sports we don't really engage in a in an activity where you work with other people to produce an output it's right it's always hey the other guys competition i should i need to do better than that person and if possible sabotage that person as you would have seen in some of the uh, movies like three idiots and so on and so forth right so that mindset 
hurts and it it uh, people come it like hit running into a brick wall brick wall when they come into an organization after education so after right. sitting in a classroom for 12 years plus engineering or whatever they study uh, everyone studies whatever which is this individual driven focus then they come into an organization and say hey now you got to work with so many other people to produce output for the organization and they have never learned to do that right, right? this has to be inculcated from a, from a very young age right right uh, the other very weird thing uh, so i know a lot of people study something in their undergrad and then often try to do an mba right and the mba is supposed to be a graduate program or a post graduate right. program uh, in in a sense that it's a masters program right but if you actually look at it the mba is an undergraduate program why do i say that see let's let's stick to something like computer science or electronics or whatever it's right? so if if you've studied computer science you will study 20 different subjects you will study graph theory you will study compiler theory you will study uh, whatever you will study so many so many subjects and then if you want to do a masters in any one of them you will pick one of those subjects and then do much more in depth in your masters yeah. right now compare that to an mba in an mba you do a little bit of hr a little bit of finance a little bit of operations a little bit of uh, whatever accounting a little bit of uh, uh, brand marketing brand management so on and so forth right you are learning a little bit about all of the different functions in the company you're not going very deep into any of them so that is actually right. an undergraduate course whereas if you i mean in, even in mba you learn a little bit of tech you learn how to work with excel sheets and maybe a little bit of computing for people who may not come from the computing background and so on right so technically if you look at if you look at a company uh, tech is just one department then you have marketing sales finance etc you have all of these departments but we consider undergraduate to be the degree that you get in one department and a postgraduate to be the degree that you get across all of the departments which is messed up which is which should be the other way around right uh, nice this is a good analogy yeah never thought it that way so <laughs> i'm kind of shocked because this kind of broke me down to you know we call it masters and bachelor in administration that is just because you do it after you do one degree and after you your graduation degree. right yeah, you, you just, just do it after your graduation that's why it's called post graduate it's like a name given to someone like right. i call myself doc- dr sagar dhawan i am not doctor but i just call myself doctor you know it's it's kind of that okay so what's the solution so so there are the other thing is that and I'm working with nascom being a visiting professor also being <clears throat> in the industry for a really long time i understand that the undergraduate programs are actually not built for application so let's uh, which what is your uh, undergraduate specialization oh it's shocking it's biotechnology i've done btech from biotechnology very nice right now did you have i mean it's not that i know much about biotechnology but did you have anything on uh, maybe yeah. genome sequencing or uh, or uh, how say i mean theoretical aspects as in you know how is medical research done and so on right. and so forth right whereas in the bio if you join a biotech or a pharma firm or something like that it will be more around hey how do i collect data or how do i analyze data how right. do i work with supplies or suppliers and distributors and so on and so forth right uh, i'll stick to uh, say i mean i started electronics i know a lot more about computer science and so on and so forth you will you have these these theoretical concepts about how do programming languages work how do compilers work which are the ones that that work with programming languages how do uh, the math behind all of this in electronics you have things like signal systems so if there is a it's again a lot of math right so the signaling systems you have electronic uh, uh, semiconductor technology and microwave technology and this and that and so forth right those are highly research oriented topics they are not right industry oriented topics so the the common complaint that you will see from anyone who uh, from any industry hiring so in any hr or any hiring manager is that 
guys, the people who come out from any college and it could be the IITs and IIMs, I mean, they are better than the rest, but even those, right? They are not industry ready. They can't do what it takes to be in the company. So we need to spend three months training them on what needs to be done in the company. And if you ask any student after four or five years after graduating and you ask them, hey, what part of your graduate course, of your undergraduate course are you learning? They'll say it's less than 10%. I learned too much junk, which I'm never using anywhere. Right? Mm-hmm. And I've forgotten all of it. Right? So this is a big gap. Right? This one way or one tool to kind of address this was the ITIs, Industrial Training Institutes. However, they are not really well suited for high tech and hence high when i say tech i mean highly skilled jobs and hence highly paid jobs right the ones uh, that require new age technology pretty much computers right so i think that system so but that is very much a uh, what should i say skilling for the job right you learn whatever is to be done at the job right, right. but we need more such frameworks to be done for all of the different uh, disciplines that you have, right? It's no right. good learning biotech if, I mean, if you're going to do data analytics, you'd rather learn how to do data analytics with the tools than learn some abstract theoretical concepts which you're going to forget the day out, the day you are out of college. That makes sense. That makes sense. Only only one of our friends who's uh, pursuing a PhD in Eames now uh, in uh, genetics. So we're kind of very proud of him uh, that you are doing what... Uh, we all were supposed to do. So you are exactly doing the right thing. Uh, so let, there, we need those people, let them go to research. And that right. is where they should study all of these theoretical concepts, right? But for the people who right. want to yeah. get into industry, either by starting a startup themselves or by getting a job, don't unnecessarily teach them this uh, this theoretical stuff. Right, right. Uh, uh, Arun, do you think we are so many in numbers? Right. Implementing a lot of strategies in covering the gaps uh, would be difficult for the government bodies also. And even uh, I always think that, you know, the the policymakers are not stupid. They it's not that they don't know about all of this is happening. Maybe maybe it's like, but they're like, it's a bottleneck. You know, you can't just solve it right now. We are so many. How are they going to go ahead with this while there are so many? other things going on. Uh, What do you think could be the first step that can be taken towards towards creating more open-minded students who first of all understand what they want to do and then they pursue that and then they implement it and then they, you know, give it back to the industry. Right. Uh, I think there will be a bit of lag. That's okay. So, Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, no worries. So, so what could that be? The first is, uh, you know, let's 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 start with the theory and then come to the practical or whatever. Uh, okay, let's just jump right into it. So, till twenty twenty, I'd say not even twenty 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 fifteen ish. There was the unsaid expectation among students, at least. Which was that the world has not changed much in this regard from 1960. What do I mean by that? Previous traditional job that many parents and stuff, you would, you would many parents would have been in a single job for their entire life. Right? They'll spend 35 right. years uh, in, a, in, a, in a company in their career. right? Uh, also, even if they switch sometimes once or twice, which is pretty rare, they might switch maybe twice in their entire career or whatever, uh, the, they've switched to a similar role. They do the same thing in a different company. Right. right? right. The, the thinking behind that is to spend the first 20 to 25 years of your life learning something, right? Learning accounting, learning fine, learning engineering, learning HR, doing whatever, learn, learning some, some uh, discipline. And then you spend the next 40 years applying that learning. Right. You never have to learn anything else. Just keep well, the first 25 years of your life is all that you learn. And then right. you just apply what you learn, right? That concept has been turned on its head. It's no longer true, right? The stuff that was current when you join your undergrad program will become obsolete by the time you leave it. You have to relearn stuff, right? So first, 
all of us all of us including students and uh, so on don't depend so first get out of this mindset that hey you know i have gone to college now this is what i'm going to do for the rest of my life no that whatever you went to college may be applicable for a couple of years and then it's going to become obsolete you have to relearn and when i say relearn you have to relearn theoretical stuff as well read books or take courses or go back to school go for a short course go for uh, whatever go 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 for a multiple masters if you need to right right one by one whatever right you will need to do this throughout the rest of your life the the careers simply are changing too fast so uh, ai as a career didn't exist 3 years ago right? right now there are a lot of them data science as a career didn't exist maybe 10 years ago it seems to have gone through a boom and a bust right, right. web development again there the app development when i was in ola uh, or even prior to that there were no app developers in the country or there were very few in the world it seems to have gone through a boom and a bust in 10 years right Uh, right. you you have no idea what new professions or what new skills will be required uh, even in a few years uh, so so no one can depend on saying i am going to execute what i learned in college that gets obsolete very quickly you have to relearn and when i say relearn learn the theoretical stuff by reading books and taking courses and stuff uh, also learn the soft skills which will get you leadership which there are some workshops and things that help with that but a lot of it comes through trial and error and experience for example right. if uh, my one of my personal motivations for going into teaching becoming a visiting professor was to improve my public speaking skills right i realize it's a it's a difficult skill it's a valuable skill not many people can speak very well to a classroom full of students so, or even generally in public it's good to practice that and hone it could i have mm-hmm. learned it in in a classroom probably not they will they could give me some framework saying you know structure your presentations this way or look at the audience and so on but unless you apply it several times and hone it over and over again it's it's not going to develop right it's a, it's right. a it's a skill like learning how to swim or how to cycle it's not a skill like learning how to do calculus so you have to keep right. practicing it to to get better at it right and you will make mistakes initially and you will get better at it later right so yeah so this is what i'd say for for people saying don't so one don't when i say don't depend on on school or college i mean don't depend on the any government whether it's central government state government or whatever saying here is the system of education that is only for the first 25 years beyond that currently these systems don't exist so you have to make them yourself right right, right? no that makes sense that makes sense so the first step is taking the responsibility of yourself on your own and right. understanding what just you said you know you have right. to keep on learn relearn unlearn relearn and then be- become better and then you know keep on uh, growing uh, fast right that, there are enough resources for that there are enough resources on the internet yeah right yeah find them yeah. and use them right yeah yeah well, that makes sense uh, or, or, uh, you know before this i had a a podcast with a gentleman called Samir Sathe who is the founder of Exact now what they do is they typically focus on skill development of students not just students but they go one step back and uh, look at parents also you know mm-hmm. so they try to give it back to them so that they understand what is required and then they you know do it via parents uh, for students which is a great initiative uh, i asked him a very maybe a stupid question <laughs> that, that uh, do you you know that do you think people look at their uh, children as an investment not from a you know i don't know how to politically put it but let me put it straight away so do you think that uh, it's not a question for you it's what i asked him that do you think that people put their money in their in the children's education so that they uh, think that, that the or, or in the students that they think they will be there when they are required to be there which is absolutely right there is nothing wrong in it uh the question that i want to ask you is a bit different uh it is about this do you think looking at education just as a roi kind of a thing that i invest this amount of money let's say doing uh, mba in a very good college i will get such salary so the motivation is salary you see mm-hmm. it's not the skill that you are going to get even after being in the top institute of uh, 
of the country where lack of lakhs and lakhs of people are filing up the forms giving the exams and then getting into iits and iims and isbs of the world but you're looking at the salary that you will get so do you think the uh, that approach even is wrong uh, for the smartest of the students right now here i realize that i'm speaking from a very elitist point of view when i say this right the the reality for most indians middle class lower middle class whatever is that the the pay is important right they they can't live their life even a even a barely decent sustainable life without a, a fair amount of pay now let me let me give you an outcome of that so it has changed for the better or it has changed a lot in the last 10 years but early before 10 years ago uh, all of the top b schools and things they you, there was a sense that hey these guys only hire engineers or only take engineers right you don't have people from uh, other academic streams coming in and there were accusations that hey your exams are built such that are designed so that only engineers can crack them if someone's a psychology graduate or an english graduate they can't even crack it why do you have this kind of exam right that was not the issue what was happening is 10 odd years ago the best way for people to earn a decent life a decent living was to go into engineering for example if i studied music right again i'm talking about 10 years ago 15 years ago whatever if i studied music or if i studied sport or say physiotherapy or something like that right i can't say that hey you will live a decent life and earn 50000 rupees 1 lakh rupees a month uh, more or less guaranteed you you can i mean you can say doesn't the physiotherapist of the indian cricket team earn that much of course they do right but there is only one or two people like that right if 10 lakh people are going to study physiotherapy what are they going to do right there the jobs didn't exist the jobs existed only in engineering and that too pretty much only in software okay there was some other engineering as well right so parents who had seen a lot of hardship who had seen the difficulties of not having and decent income would push their uh, their uh, children saying hey i don't care about your likes and desires and stuff like that i know it is important for you to have a steady income go study engineering right this right. is what will get you a get you a job which will get you a steady income figure out your passions after that hence the best students ended up studying engineering now what these cat and all the the uh, exams admission tests do is they just filter for the smartest minds now the smartest minds happen to be engineers right that's why you found two very engineers going into it's not that the exam is designed to filter for engineers it's just designed to filter for high iq high grit and high you know uh, what should i say being able to withstand a lot of pressure during that exam period and uh, select for people who can prepare for a long time basically all all characteristics of hard work and intelligence and so on it just so happened that because of this this focus and and you know it's it's a right focus towards getting a, a salary all of those happened to be engineers fortunately mm-hmm. there has been changing now in the last few years there have been some interventions that say hey we need more women we need more non engineers we need more people who are not fresh out of college they have at least some work experience and so on and so forth mm-hmm. so those have started right uh, sorry that was part of the question what was the other one yeah okay. the question was that uh, looking at education as an investment and right. ultimately expect right. a good roi not right. the skills so with that background the salary does make a difference i mean if people are going to to a b school or any kind of higher education with the same background saying hey i need a better income as i said yeah so that that is a harsh reality for a lot of people in in the country you can even ask a lot of people from fairly good schools including the iits and unfortunately there are too many incidents of students who say hey this is something i hate i never wanted to do this but i've been pushed to do this just because hopefully it will get me a, a great job and uh, earn, earn a decent salary right so my as i said and very elitist point of view is to saying hey pursue your passions do what excites you and so on which is true now if you have the financial cushion to 
make some mistakes and say, I can go for a year without earning, I'll still not starve and be on the street. Then I'd say, okay, don't don't go to the B schools or don't go to schools chasing the salary. Right? If you have right. some financial question, uh, cushion, uh, make sure you pick something that you enjoy. Or let me rephrase that. The word is not to say that you enjoy. Pick something that you can tolerate for a long time. Right? Every job has, has ups and downs. But if you do something where the worst part of the jobs are, or the bad part of the job is so bad that you can't take it and your mental peace is messed up and so on, you feel stressed out, your health suffers and so on, then get out of it. Right? Get to a job where you obviously enjoy the nice parts of it and you can tolerate the poor parts of it, the bad parts of it. Right? That is the job that, and you can you can stay there. Right? Again, as I said, this is a very elitist, elitist or a, a point of view and from a person who can speak English, who's gone to a good school, who has a fair amount of uh, financial cushion and stuff. I realize very much that this is not the case for uh, most of the world, for most of India. Mm -hmm. Hence, they probably have to make the decision saying, hey, I'm going uh, for further studies in the hopes of getting uh, a better income later. And that's it. I don't don't care about my passions. I don't care anything else. I just want a better income. Right, right. There's a lot of backstory that goes behind this i guess it's not it's not that simple analogy but i i, I love what you said what you just said it's beautiful uh, it's not what you l- don't do what you love i mean that is one thing that of course you do what you love uh, you know uh, that you will anyway but, do yeah that, that you will do but do something that you can tolerate for a longer time this is so beautiful i mean <laughs> i think we are going to put this as the tagline of the podcast you know, do something that you can tolerate for the longest period of your time you know of, of your life like like marriage <laughs> jokes apart um all right uh this has been great arun uh you see now when you go to iams and masters union and you know different colleges and top you meet with maybe it's not a right word but definitely is yes, seeing through the test that we do the admission test the top uh, minds in in terms of students uh, of india uh from an academic standpoint, I'm trying to be politically correct here, just just that. Uh, what do you think is the thing that you get in a IIM, in IITs, or in these elite institutes? Again, Master is coming to my mind because it has proven itself in like last two, three years. So I'm just carrying it with IIMs uh, always. Uh, what do you think this these section of education provides which the regular MBA schools or regular edu- you know, engineering schools are not giving? What is that two, three things that you get there? So, uh, to be honest, it's not the school, right? Uh, and also, there's an article published by an alumnus of Harvard just about a week ago and so on. All of these schools, brands, anything that you have on your, all of these are brands, right? Whether it's a school right. name or a workplace name. I can say I've worked at Microsoft, I've worked at McKinsey. So these are all brands on my resume. They're all signaling factors saying I am signaling to a prospective employer or someone that, hey, I am smart enough to have been able to make it to these brands, which are world renowned or world recognized as, as great brands, right? It's mm-hmm. not that the brand, the, I mean, in the case of organizations, it's slightly different, but in the case of educational institutions, it's not that the scores or the syllabus or the books or anything are any different in an IIT or an IIM as compared to uh, any other school, right? Anyone can buy those same books. Mm-hmm. All of the the courses are pretty much available online for free, right? Uh, there's nothing specific that the institution does. The institution right. shines because of the quality of students who come in, right? Mm -hmm. If you have great students coming in who are hardworking, who have shown grit and determination and whatnot, then if you give give them the same tools that someone without those characteristics, the same tools with that, this person is going to be able to do more with their life, right? So that is why employers and whatever else come to these institutions. It's not because... The IITians learn some different computer science from, say, a small engineering college in a uh, in a smaller town. They learn the same thing. But it's that this person, by the fact that they've gone to an IIT or an IIM or a master's junior or whatever, have proved that they have, again, signaling, right? They've proved that they can work hard. They've proved that they at least have a fair amount of uh, knowledge of math. They are able to study 
and crack uh, difficult exams and so on and so forth. They'll probably do the same at the workplace. They'll, they'll work hard, right? It's not that they're learning anything that these guys don't learn. It's the other way, basically. It's not the... Ins it's because of the students that this institute is Absolutely. kind of... Student. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, would you, would you can, agree? Sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. No, no, please, please go ahead. I'm saying that... Uh, so this is momentum, right? Even two or three years. So it takes a long time for this perception to get built. For example, ISB is one of the newer ones. It's about 25-ish years old. Uh, it has done a great job of quickly getting into the leagues of uh, the IIMs, which are over 50 years old, 60 years old, and so on. Right. Uh, because of the quality of students. Now, that momentum will carry it forward. It's the same with Masters Union. It's coming up in the last few years. Uh, that momentum will carry it forward such that even if there is one bad year in that students aren't great, there was a recession and people couldn't get placed or whatever, it will not hurt the brand too much. But if there are multiple consecutive bad events like this, then it will start hurting the brand. As you might have seen with some, of the, in fact, some names of colleges in Bangalore come to mind, uh, great institutions over time uh, just became poor because of poor practices in the, in the, uh, in the students, in the faculty and so on, which made them unhirable. So eventually, ind industry makes its mind that, hey, you know, it looks like nobody can be hired from this school. So let's right. avoid it altogether. And then it, uh, there is a momentum that goes downhill as well. So once that starts, even if the, even if the administration makes, it a, makes an effort to start getting in good students and whatnot, that perception will take some time to change. So there is momentum right. both ways. Right, right. No, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I had one question. I just missed it. I, I mean, it was just coming in the flow uh, of the conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, it was this. You see, I, I, I've seen a lot of IITNs and IMs around me. Uh, and, and it feels good. You know, you're signaling. It feels good to be around them. You, you feel smart that you are, you are amongst the smartest brat uh, in the circle. But there are a lot of things that you also learn there. That, that's what I have seen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like guesstimation. Nobody from my college, at least I know, uh, nobody taught us uh, what guesstimation is, uh, what a case study is, you know. And, and I learned that guesstimation is such a beautiful practice. If you do it for like three months or six months on a very small scale, uh, you're going, your brain will open to some other extent. You're going to start thinking and looking at things in a whole different uh, holistic way and try to have an approach to everything, which is... The good part about uh, uh, guesstimation that I love is that it's not a result-oriented thing. It's a process-oriented thing. What's the process that you're looking at to answer the question? So these are the skills that you get in these you know, institutes, which you generally don't get in the tier twos and tier three colleges. That's what I feel. So you can ask, these are open source. What I mean to say is you can, you can probably find it on any IIM site or IIT site. They'll give you these are the courses that we teach. These are the modules that we cover. Or you ask any any oh. recent grad, hey, what did you learn? And he'll tell you that I learned guesstimation or I learned something else, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's very easy for anyone to either pick up a book themselves or uh, for a college to say, okay, we're going to also going to start doing this, right? Uh, we're going to have live internships and projects and so on and so forth, right? Taking the artifact and copying it is not very hard. Uh, so in fact, in fact, uh, let let me give you a different kind of example. So, sure. uh, a lot of supply chain primarily optimizing and quality uh, practices frameworks have come from Toyota, right? Total quality management, statistical quality control, lean, six sigma, everything has come from Toyota, right? Toyota has open sourced its entire Kanban. Uh, Scrum, Agile, a lot of things have come to Toyota. So uh, Toyota has open sourced this entire management model. Anyone can visit the plant, just request an appointment, go visit the plant, they'll walk you through the whole thing, saying this is where this happens, this happens, this is what we thought, and so on and so forth, right? And there have been a lot of books, a lot of consultants who speak about this, try to implement this in other organizations, things, but they fail miserably. You ask any software engineer who's worked pretty much in any company, and you ask them, hey, uh, did you did you use or do you know Agile? Have you used an Agile model? They'll say, yes, we had Scrum, right? We used to have a Scrum team. We used to have a daily stand-up and so on and so forth. 
Uh, but if you look at whether the organization is agile in the true English meaning of the, of the word, that is, are they able to respond quickly? Probably not. Mm. Right? So what I'm trying to say is, uh, there is actually a, a pyramid that says the, the artifacts that you see. And so let's take an example of, of lean, right? Lean manufacturing, lean systems. They say yeah. minimize waste. Don't, uh, don't waste stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of, a lot, a lot of and, uh, they are Indian organizations who don't understand the philosophy or the concept behind this translate it to something as, uh, what should I say, blase as or, or as, uh, uh, glib as, hey, okay, instead of taking notes on a full sheet of paper, take notes on a post-it script. I mean, that right. is not the point. That is what, because that is what the manager or someone can see. He would come and see, hey, instead of people taking notes in meetings in a, in a, in a book, they just stick things in post-it notes and put them on the wall. But the, the philosophy behind it probably we don't have these meetings in the first place. They are a waste right. of time. It's not about a waste of paper. Paper costs nothing. But people's a management team's time and the team's time pay costs a lot more. Don't waste that. Right. So there is a pyramid that says the artifacts are the easiest thing to see and easiest to replicate. The next are the tools and processes. Things like running a daily scrum is a process. Things like having a regular cadence for updating your software or whatever, whatever are all processes. Those are harder, but those are again more visible. You can go stay, spend a week at Toyota or any, any company that does this well and see what they do and say, hey, you know, these guys have a daily scrum. We should also have a daily scrum. But coming down to the part that, hey, a daily scrum is used to focus on what is the bottleneck right now the bottleneck it so that tomorrow you are better than where you are today, right? You have right. made progress. You might hit a different bottleneck, but at least you solved this problem, right? That is the philosophy behind this car. This is hard to see. This is hard to understand and they don't get it. So all that um, several companies here do is say, okay, we're going to have a daily scrum. We're going to use post-it notes. That is going to make us magically like Toyota. It is not, right? So uh, coming back to the, the point on education, you can refer to the IITs and the IIMs. What are the tools they use? What are the processes they use? Do they use a case study method? That's a process. What are the books? Do they? What are the books they use? Uh, do they design their classroom in a you know in a pie uh, shape so that everyone is facing the center? The lecturer can stand at the podium in the center and whatnot. These are easy to copy, but the philosophy behind okay, why are they doing this? Let's use the case study method so that people think about various different angles and ask questions debate among themselves and speak right. to the professor as an as a peer saying hey what this guy is not smarter than me just because the professor is older doesn't mean they are smarter than the students these are smarter students who are coming into harvard or iits or iams and so on right so being able to have a discussion with them as a peer so these are the philosophies which often are not being taken in the uh, in, in uh, you know, lower rung institutes right that makes sense uh, yes so when you spoke about the point about estimate and and certain processes or artifacts, those can be easily copied, but they may not achieve the same result. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, either you have to, it's it's all about the circle, as I said, you know, you have to have people who are doing all of these activities with you. So you learn with the group also. You, you learn with people. You, you have to around. imbibe it as well. And you know, right. in, imbibing is not always inside out. <clears throat> A lot of it is outside in. What do I mean by that? A lot of people say to, if you want to develop a new, and there's this book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, right? Yeah, yeah. Amazing book, amazing book. Uh, <clears throat> so there is a loop between what is called behavior and what is called identity. So I personally, I'm now much fitter than I was a couple of years ago. In fact, I'm really fit. A uh, few years ago, I was not. I was uh, I would borderline unfit, uh, choppy. I wouldn't say I was fat, right? Well, not great there, right? Now, what happens is most theory, if you if you speak to a dietitian, if you speak to a motivational speakers and so on, they'll say, hey, you got to want something really bad. You need to have the motivation and then you will do stuff in line with that motivation. It doesn't right. work that way. It often works the other way. So I'm going to take the example of fitness. It works in a lot of other things. So if I say, hey, you know, I will just uh, visit the gym every day as in I don't want to do anything. I just go 
walk to the gym and walk back right you do that for a, you do that for a week and then after a week you'll be like anyway i'm at the gym let me just do one push up right or you can do the push up at home of course you say i want to do one push up right you might do it once you might you might do it for a couple of days and then if if someone asks you hey do you work out you will say nah you know i mean i really don't work out i just do one push up a day i've been doing it for the last 3 days right you continue that you get to 2 5 10 and you keep the streak of 10 for 10 days you you're doing 10 push ups for 10 days at that time if someone comes and asks you hey do you work out you will look back and you will say yes boss i do i do 10 push ups a day and i've been doing this for the last month i've been doing this for the last 10 days right when you you yourself say that your motivation changes to the point where you say look i am not a person who is unfit anymore i am a guy who goes to the gym who tries to take care of my fitness that spills over in things like diet you will not eat junk food if you have effectively told yourself i am a fit guy i am a trying guy who is trying to get fit right so i will not eat pizza or you know junk burgers and stuff like that let yeah. me try to take a better so behavior can change your identity and then the identity will drive behavior new behavior right right so that's what i mean by uh, by you you're talking about spending time with others and and imbibing their philosophy when it comes to comes to education it is both ways sometimes for example it's important for a person who doesn't know scrum and agile or any or the guesstimate method to just say look don't worry about the philosophy just do 10 guesstimates that will teach you oh now i understand what is the, the reasoning behind this how are you supposed to tackle this how you then you understand the philosophy and then it will you will become better at uh, at the behavior no that makes sense that makes sense arun great we have, we have talked about a lot of things we have talked about about your journey product management nascom uh, the gaps in the education what are we really looking at what's the problem how to become the front office instead of the back office i mean being back office is great <laughs> that's not bad that's where that's what pushed us to you know Sorry, becoming the front office we didn't office. finish the thoughts on the front office but go on if you have a yeah, question i was yeah yeah i was yeah. actually coming to that so we didn't right. f- yeah. finish of the front uh, and, and you kind of asked me to uh, just get the job done it right. that was jobs to be done so, right yeah jobs to be done so i was i was i was about to come to that so we missed these two things front office right. and this so so what do you want to pick first Let, let's do the the jobs to be done right okay <clears throat> so uh, there is this you can all look it up on youtube there is a video by professor Play, uh, clayton christensen uh, who invented the jobs to be done framework uh, he says that he he was working with a uh, with a fast food company i suspect it's mcdonalds but i mean he doesn't name it as such right so he says hey they used to make milkshakes and they had a few varieties of milkshakes uh, certain uh, flavors and what not and they wanted to push up their sales right they tried several things they tried having a new line of flavors they tried tweaking the price whatever nothing happened the sales remained flat so then they consulted with uh, dr christensen and his team and said hey you know can you help us come and solve this problem right so he and his team came they spent a week or several days in the in that fast food uh, restaurant counter making detailed notes and speaking to some of the customers who came and bought this uh, this milkshake right and they noticed some very uh, you know funny things this is in the us where days typically start a little earlier than india so he said yeah. everyone comes in between 6:30 to 7 am right they all come in alone nobody comes with a partner right and they're all driving to work when they are buying this milkshake right then they asked a few of them hey you know so effectively what they're asking is what is the job for which you are hiring the milkshake not in those particular words but that is what they are the meaning of what they're asking them yeah. they would t- change the language accordingly right and they got a lot of insights so they they so one person said hey uh i uh, so what they effectively figured out is these guys have a long commute to their work half an hour commute or so on right and they are just bored they are stuck in traffic or whatever they are just bored they listen to the radio that's okay they want something to munch right to chew or whatever something to eat or drink while they are on their commute to keep them bored to keep them awake and engaged right yeah yeah so some now they asked one person and he said i tried a banana right and he says never try a banana one it is difficult to peel it and eat it while you are driving 
plus it's gone in like two seconds and you're still you're hungry by the time you reach office again right, right? right. then another person said i tried a candy bar snickers or something like that and uh, that's again i felt very guilty because i'm eating sugar the first thing in the morning right so i didn't want to do that someone else said you know i tried a bagel it's like a like a piece of bread pretty much right but uh, you have to spread some cream cheese and jam and stuff on it to make it tasty and while you're driving uh, it's hard to uh, do that you have to hold your steering wheel with your feet with your legs and knees and so on it's just, it just doesn't work and a milkshake is the uh, is the best thing that uh, Uh, works for them right now the insight was see the competitor to milkshake is not a different brand a different company's milkshake in the minds of the customer the competitor to milkshake is coffee or a burger or whatever right some some kind of breakfast cereal maybe or whatever right yeah yeah because they are using the milkshake as breakfast right they are not comparing mcdonald's milkshake versus burger king milkshake or something else milkshake they are comparing milkshake to other things that do the same job right right with that insight they just figured out hey make the milkshake thicker and make the straw thinner so that it lasts longer make it more slushy or whatever job done sales shot up right okay okay uh, yes so this is what i mean by when we when we're talking about the the uh, jobs to be done slides and so on define your target market in terms of jobs to be done don't define it in terms of demographics so in this case the job to be done mm. was people who need a need to stay full uh, until lunch time or whatever during their breakfast commute now it could be an elderly person it could be a vp of a company it could be a student uh, you know just at their internship but they all have the same right. right right don't right. define it in terms of demographics Right, right. It doesn't matter what their age group is, where they belong to, or whatever. The problem exactly. is the center of uh, exactly, the entire... exactly. Right. And let me give you a, a much more Indian example. Uh, in sure, this. sure. <clears throat> so this is uh, regarding the Delhi metro, right? And you're from uh, from NCR. Anyone who's not from NCR is probably sick of people from from Delhi boasting <laughs> about the Delhi metro, right? <laughs> <laughs> so and, and admittedly it's by far the best it's very extensive it's on par with the best metro systems in the world and yeah so, I've, right? i've heard a joke on this that uh, people say like the mumbai guy says that you know we have metro coming in and we are like you know boss we are going to i mean demolish it we, we are going to demolish it we are going to replace the first edition of metro in our place so don't tell us that you have a metro coming absolutely in. absolutely right now if you ask anyone in delhi or anyone who's used the metro saying you know why do you like it uh they'll say a couple of things one is you know clean it's on time uh very convenient it's uh, it has huge coverage pretty much anywhere you go within a half kilometer you'll find a metro station in delhi right. right so it has great coverage across the entire city and so on and so forth right now this is not anecdotal it's somewhat true but i might get a yeah so who was the director of uh, of the delhi metro when it was first launched no idea it was uh, dr e shridharan right okay right so i i think this was the atal bihari vajpayee government at the time not sure who was the delhi government uh, delhi shila dikshit i was was it shila dikshit i don't know it was it probably must have been a, a joint venture between both of them uh, to start up the metro so as is typical with many uh, with many government projects Dr. Sridharan was given a very vague statement saying, "Hey, you know, we want to build a metro. Why? Uh, you know, uh, public transport for poor people. Uh, let's give them easy access, easy commute. Something vague like that. Say, go do it, right? Now, what Dr. Sridharan did? Uh, sorry, they said we uh, uh, we want to ha huh, public transport for poor people that will solve jams, traffic jams in in Delhi, right?" so go do it now he went back to his desk and obviously his team they did a bunch of studies and they came back and said hey you know are you sure you want to solve traffic jams now then he showed his research and i can show you again uh, some uh, slides right so yes this is padma vibhushan dr e sridharan and as we mentioned the initial problem statement from the government was let's ease traffic congestion by providing affordable public transport for the poor right 
So Dr. Sridhar went back to his team and, and you know, figured out what causes traffic congestion. If you really want to ease the traffic in Delhi, traffic congestion is caused by huge personal cars, not buses. You have yeah. an SUV with one person sitting inside it. That is what is causing the traffic congestion. Not a bus. A bus carries 70 people in a fairly limited amount of space. Right? right. That means the SUV guys, people who are driving an SUV alone are rich. They are not the poor slum dwellers and so on. Right? So who is causing the traffic congestion? The rich folks, not the poor folks. Right? right. Which means if you build public transport for the poor, you take them out of the bus and put them into the metro, that's not going to solve the problem. Right? That is right. not going to solve the congestion problem. Right, This is what a traffic jam looks like. There's not a single bus. Right? That's right. From here, you want to get to this state where there's a, I mean, relatively free roads. Right, And there's an autowala going the wrong way, <laughs> which I think they do in every city. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what right. autos are meant for. <laughs> exactly. Right? So for this, you need to convince People, rich people who are driving the SUVs to leave their SUVs at home and take the metro instead, right? Right. Now, that changes everything. That changes... So, with starting with routing. So, your metro route has to go through the places where the rich people live. It can't... It oh. doesn't have to, right? Because they, they have to leave their car and be, have easy access to this thing. It has to go to the yeah. workspaces that the rich people go to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The other great thing is that Say, for example, someone who's driving a car spends 200 rupees in petrol a day uh, in the commute, right? You can charge 50 rupees a ticket and still they will take it. It's worth it for them. Whereas if a poor person is spending 20 rupees in, on a bus ticket, they can't, they will not switch to a 50 rupee metro ticket, right. right? But if you build the solution for rich people where it is worth it, then you can charge more and hence the, the, the project becomes profitable. You know, it becomes self -sustaining. You don't need to keep getting funds from the government. Right, right. right. Uh, you can invest in technology. So several of the lines are fully automatic. Right. Right. Because you were able to get the revenues. Right. You can invest in safety. You can invest, obviously, I'm not saying poor people don't need cleanliness or safety. Obviously, they do. But, you know, you can invest in a lot of higher standards and whatnot. You can have signage in English, whatever. Just the fact that you reframed the problem, which drove revenue, which drove everything else. Uh, brings a lot of these aspects together right 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 so so this is the this is the definition of who what is the problem and what i what sorry who is the customer and what problem are you trying to solve for that customer right hmm. so hmm. dr shridhar figured it out and said hey look if your objective is to decongest delhi if your objective is to get rid of delhi traffic jams you need to do it this way you need to build right. it for rich people going through the areas that rich people definitely go to a corner place or whatever. And that's the only way this thing's going to work. Right. Uh, fortunately, at that time, uh, over the governments were, and they said, yes, go ahead with it. Right. Now, just think about it in terms of this is an easy, it's not about education, but the political ramifications. Somebody has to stand up in Lok Sabha and say, we are going to spend 50,000 crores building a solution for rich people. Right. Right. Because that's what is required. Right. They'll obviously get a lot of flack saying, how is this justified? It is that why are you not spending that money on poor people? But but it worked. And that's why 25 years later, you're still people are talking about it saying this is a grand success. Right. right. It started with this. This is true product management thinking in a non software field. So hats off right. to Dr. Sridharan, uh, who was able to, uh, you know, pull this off. Yeah. Shout out to him. Shout out to him. Yeah. Right. Great. It was a great insight, Arun. I mean, wow. Never thought of that metro was meant for the rich people, not for the poor people. Oh my God. This is great. It's it's wonderful. Thank you very much for, uh, for this slide. This was really helpful. Okay, this is one. Now, let's talk about the front office. Uh, how do we get to the front right. office? So, we were talking about how India has started flexing and, you know, has started gaining confidence and so on. It... Uh, <clears throat> It needs to do a better job of marketing itself as reliable, good, and so on. So all all the metro systems. So uh, I'm forgetting which CEO, a fairly 
well-known CEO of a, of a fairly large startup uh, in, in the United States, visited Bengaluru uh, about two weeks ago, and he was blown away. He said, the metro is spotless. The NYC subway is filthy. Right. Right. The airport, Bangalore's airport has been awarded the most efficient airport uh, in the country. I think volumes are still higher in Mumbai and Delhi, uh, but Bangalore has been, uh, it's also very, very pretty. The new one just looks like a showcase, right? It's, it's a showcase piece. It's really pretty, right? So hmm. they've done a great job there. Whereas if you've ever been to Frankfurt airport or any other, they're ugly, honestly. They might be big. They might be carrying a lot of traffic, efficient and whatnot. Uh, they are nowhere as close to as pretty these are. Uh, also, I, I had I visited uh, Toronto uh, in in uh, 2023. It took us over two and a half hours to get out of the airport to finish the formalities there and get out. Right, the efficiency with which Indian airports work is just amazing. Right, uh, things like the passport issuing system. If you if you apply for a new passport, you get the confirmation that your passport has been dispatched. Before you leave the, off, the passport office and right. get, start right. riding back home, right? You get it in three days. It makes you wonder, is Tatkal even worth it? As in, how does it get faster than this, right? The service levels, efficiency levels and things that are happening in India, UPI is, of course, a game changer that we don't even need to talk about. Uh, yeah, India yeah. is marketing it very well, right? So how do you get to be the front office, flex these, uh, take advantage of the soft power in India? That is, to be honest, India, in terms of tourism, tends to sell only Taj Mahal. Why? Have yeah. you visited, say, something like the Padmanabha Swami Temple in Kerala and whatnot? Yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. they're just amazing, right? Uh, there are forts all over the place. Even in North India, you have, uh, I mean, you have Jaipur Fort and so on, or you have Lal Kila. Uh, even outside of Delhi or whatever, right? Why aren't we talking more about it? Why does India just uh, get associated with this one monument, right? So, uh, flex the soft power, flex the fact that a lot of systems and a lot of processes in India are beyond world class, right? right. And uh, some of the products, for example, Zoho is a great, great Exam yeah, software yeah. tool which has come from India, right? There is so when once India gets that visibility and that trust across the world and from Indians, right? Indians need to trust that. Uh, an operating system or something developed in India, phone made in India, a, uh, a laptop or whatever made in India is high quality. It is the yeah. level of uh, quality that I expect from a metro station or that I expect from the passport office. I will get that with this kind of product. Uh, then you will become the front. You will, you will incentivize more and more entrepreneurs to build software, build hardware and whatnot. And that's how you move from being the back office, serving an external client to being the front office often uh, outsourcing to others. It, it is happening uh, though quite slowly. For example, Infosys and TCS employ several Americans and Canadians. Right? Uh, the number is not very big, but it is there. So finally, it's it, it, it's moved the other way that now there are right. there are Westerners being employed in Indian companies. It could be a lot faster. It needs to be done with more design and forethought it, means it needs to be done with purpose it now is just happening randomly right right no that makes sense honestly arun uh the the only thing that i have for this session i mean there are a lot of nuggets that i've took today i feel smarter uh like two i, I feel like two uh, two hours back i was dumb and now i'm smarter of what i was i was a i'm a better version of in terms of what I've got from this session, you've shown us different angles of different problems. And uh, we kind of understood uh, how things are working in technology space. And looking at India from a different angle also, you know, I mean, you have to just fix your lenses and then you start seeing the things. I got my passport in three days. Uh, yes. But still, I like, I'm like, you yeah, know, India is this, India is that, you know, that we're blabbering about it. But then when you look at things, uh, you you go outside, you go to Singapore, you go to any XYZ places, you see how they greet you in hotels and you go to, you go to any hotel in, in, in a fair India. good hotel in New Delhi. Yeah. In India, they greet you so well. It looks like you are their son-in-law. You know, you feel that, that you, you, you're spending something and you're getting value out of it. You're being valued to become a customer. You don't get it outside, but still 
uh, we don't focus on that. So thank you very much for the face shift that you did for me and I hopefully uh, for our viewers. Uh, and also, guys, uh, Arun, he was not really available for this session today. Uh, he kind of, he because he has a very uh, jam-packed, uh, schedule for the entire two weeks, but he kind of pulled this uh, time for us, these two hours. So I really appreciate Arun being there. And if you want to meet Arun personally in the, you know, to have more chit chat with him, he's joining us on 22nd and 23rd uh, February in the conference that we are doing in, in New Delhi. So uh, make sure that you catch up there. And uh, any last words, Arun, anything that you want to close with? I think I really enjoyed the session. Great talking to you, Sagar. And I uh, to uh, all the viewers, if you please feel free to you know walk up to me, say hi, and let me know if we could collaborate on any PM consulting roles or, uh, or, or in fact several different interests that I have. So we could always speak about those. And it was a great session. Thank you so much, Sagar, for being such a great host. Hey, thank you very much. I mean that means a lot. And uh, this is it for our viewers. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. And if you liked it, I want you to like it. Uh, click on the red button and subscribe to Ed Talk World's uh, podcast channel. Uh, support us, and we'll see you with some new updates in the education industry. Meanwhile, take care of yourself and keep on studying. Thank you very much. See you on the other side. Thank you, Arun.